Good morning. Welcome to the California edition of our state webinars series, exploring the findings from American Farmland Trust's recently released Farms Under Threat, the State of the States report. Before we get started, let me run through some logistics to help make this a good experience. Everyone has been muted, so no need to do that yourself. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you can do so by going to the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. The orange arrow at the top of that panel allows the panel to shrink and reopen. You'll see a questions section of the control panel. You can pop that section out by clicking on the little square on the right-hand side. That decouples it from the control panel. Type your questions and comments in there, and we will get to them um, during the presentation and again at the end. We are recording this webinar and we'll send the link to everybody who is registered. Please feel free to share this recording with others. So let me now introduce myself. I'm Chris Coffin. I am AFT's Senior Policy Advisor. I also direct our newly launched National Agricultural Land Network, which I'll talk about at the end of the webinar. Co-hosting with me this morning is Kara Heckert, California's regional, AFT's California Regional Director. Kara is based in Sonoma County and oversees the development and implementation of all of American Farmland Trust's programs throughout the state. We will also be joined by Katie Patterson, who is going to be the one to pose the questions to Kara and myself. For those of you who are not familiar with American Farmland Trust, let me do a quick introduction. AFT is a national nonprofit membership organization founded in 1980. We work to save the land that sustains us by protecting farmland, promoting sound farming practices, and keeping farmers on the land. Some know us best by our No Farms, No Food bumper sticker. We work from kitchen tables to the halls of Congress, from direct farmland protection projects to research to federal policy development and state policy development and advocacy. We have six regional offices and a national office located in Washington, D.C. And let me now turn it briefly over to Kara. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for joining us from the East Coast this morning, um, afternoon for you. I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to some of the folks that are joining us today. We have a lot of really great partners of ours that are part of this webinar, and I wanted to call a few of them out. Um, first, Department of Conservation staff, um, specifically Nate Roth and um, some other folks that have been really helpful in this project. Um, I know uh, based on the RSVPs that we have a, several agricultural land trusts um, throughout the state that are joining us, which is just great. And we have a number of programmatic and state policy partners that have also joined us. And I'd like to um, give a special recognition to the Natural Resources Conservation Service for their collaboration and support of this project. They've been an integral partner, as has our research partner in this project, Conservation Science Partners. So I'll turn it back to Chris. Thanks, Kara. So let's now talk about the findings from this report. Today, we're focusing on the State of the States, which is the second in this research series. State of the States paints a striking picture of the threats facing working farms and ranches in every state and documents the steps every state has taken to protect their agricultural land base from development. We used a multi-pronged approach that included advanced spatial mapping to identify the threats to agricultural land and an in-depth analysis of state policy responses. We're using this report to raise public awareness, to inform state and federal policy, and to encourage more direct and permanent agricultural land protection. We released the State of the States report in May, and we're extremely fortunate to have California Secretary of Agriculture, Karen Ross, join us last month for our national launch event. I encourage folks to watch the recording of that event if you are not able to join us live for it. And for those of you who did not join us then, let me touch very quickly on some of the national findings. From 2001 to 2016, a period of historically low housing starts, 
the U.S. converted 11 million acres of agricultural land. That's equivalent to all the land planted in the U.S. to fruits, nuts, and vegetables in 2017. The majority of that conversion was to low-density residential land use. We've known this type of conversion was happening because all across the country, scattered large lot housing has been fragmenting and disrupting farming and ranching for years. But until this report, no one has ever been able to map it and measure it. And once we mapped it, we realized just how big of a threat it is. Importantly, also, more than one third of the land converted, about four and a half million acres, was what we have identified as nationally significant land, land best suited for intensive food and crop production. As you can see from the national map, agricultural land conversion is a growing problem across the U.S. Um, and no longer confined to large metropolitan areas. Small cities are sprawling, and the proliferation of farmettes and ranchettes on their outskirts has created hotspots of conversion and sprawl corridors in virtually every state. So let's now switch to the interactive website. Um, and we hope that folks will make use of this website because it was built especially for this report and we think that people will find it useful in a number of different ways. So we want to point out some of the things that you can um, do through it and data you can find on it. Let's start with the reports and data tab. And let me say that um, we are joined today by Beth Fraser, who is our expert website navigator. So when I say, Beth, could you do this? That's who it is controlling the screen. So looking at this reports and data, this is where you find all of the methodology um, explained. And if you are interested in getting access to the geospatial data we used, you will find a form for that request on the tab, if you can point it out, Beth, that geospatial spatial data layers tab will take you to a form. Feel free to fill that out. We will start sending folks information about how that data will be made available um, sometime in early July is my understanding. So let's now go to the drop down menu and choose California. And here you can see that there is both spatial data and the policy scorecard. We're going to start with the spatial data. And as we do, I want to note, importantly, that California is the only state in the country with a comprehensive farmland mapping and monitor, monitoring program. Um, we give a great deal of credit to California for having done this. It's something that we are encouraging other states to do. Um, so some aspects of the analysis we did here are already available in California. And again, a special thank you to Department of Conservation staff for having walked through this data with us um, in the process of putting this um, report together because your um, assistance in helping us think it through was invaluable. Um, before we get into details, Beth, can you take a minute to point out the conversion summary? So here you will see that we have created for California, as for every state, a two-page, easily downloadable um, fact sheet that provides some of the most important um, information all in one form. We hope this is helpful. You can use it for um, any kind of information for your members, for policymakers. Um, there's some graphics that we can provide. So just please know that this is available to you. So now let's go back and look at the four categories of spatial data we've created. Let's start with land cover and use. The state of the state uses multiple national data sets to develop the best available spatial inventory nationally of agricultural land use in the US. You can zoom in on this data layer to identify every type of land use in the state, including land that we've identified as low density resident, residential development. This data layer includes federal land permitted for grazing. It also includes a first ever attempt to spatially identify woodland associated with farms and ranches. 
Our mapping shows 34 million acres of agricultural land, including 21.7 million acres of rangeland, 10.6 million acres of cropland, 1.5 million acres of pasture land, and 162,500 acres of that woodland associated with a farm or ranch. So let's now go to PVR values. For farms under threat, we wanted to analyze the quality of land that is being lost to development, not just the quantity. So we created, with the help of a national panel of experts, an index to quant quantify the productivity, versatility, and resiliency of every acre of land in the U.S. This map shows the range of these PVR values across the state. Higher PVR values, which are in the darker green, goes to, you can see in this index on the left-hand side of the screen, that um, the higher the PVR value, the darker the green going to um, a tan. Higher PVR values indicate higher suitability for long-term intensive crop production, especially for food crops such as fruits, nuts, vegetables, and staple grains. These PVR values were used to identify what we are now calling nationally significant land. So if we can go to that um, layer, that would be great. This map shows the nationally significant agricultural land in California. You'll see that 6,280,500 acres of land falls into this category, which is about 18% of the state's agricultural land base. Virtually all of this land is cropland. The loss of this highly productive land has both economic and environmental implications. When nationally significant land is impacted by development, Intensive food production is pushed to more marginal lands where input costs are typically higher, crop yields are typically lower, and soils degrade more quickly. So let's go to the last category of conversion. The data from this map is for a 15-year period from 2001 to 2016, again, a period of historically low housing starts with a recession in the midst of it. We map the conversion of agricultural land to two types of land use. The first is urban and highly developed land use. This includes the traditional culprits in farmland conversion, so expanding residential, commercial, and industrial areas. It's largely focused in cities and towns, but this category does include rural, industrial, and energy production sites, so oil and gas well pads and solar panel installations. The second type is low-density residential development, or what we've called LDR. This is the first effort of its kind to quantify the extent of large lot housing on the agricultural land base. LDR areas range from lower density subdivisions to rural areas where more and more individual houses are being built. You can see that the majority of conversion, 68%, in California over this time frame was to urban and highly developed land. This is actually a different conversion pattern than in the U.S. as a whole over this same time period where large lot residential development was the dominant conversion type. Total agricultural land converted in California was um, almost 466,000 acres. Rangeland was the most converted land type. It accounted for more than half of all converted acres, with 245,000 acres converted. Cropland was next, with almost 184,000 acres converted. And in looking at the PBR values of the land that was converted, we see that 49,000 acres of nationally significant land was converted to either urban and highly developed or LDR. Um, when you look at the PVR values of land overall though, um, a large percent, 71%, was land that ranked in the upper half of California's PVR values. That's, we find that, that significant. Um, and we can talk about that later on. So 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. Before we turn to the policy scorecard, we wanna stop and get some input from all of you. We are interested in your perspectives on what you believe will drive agricultural land conversion over the next 10 to 20 years in California. And we ask this question now because we think it's important in thinking about policy responses to know what those drivers of conversion are because it will dictate in part what the needed policy response and responses are. So here's the questions. We were, we were limited to five. If you, don't, if you think it's something other than the five here, please feel free to write that into the question box. And know that um, if you're having trouble voting, it might be because you're in full screen mode and so you need to go out of that mode in order to vote. So let's take a minute and let's have everyone vote here. Okay, Beth, what do we think? All right, so this is interesting um, that there are three that are clearly at the top, continued poorly and more um, development. Um, so thinking about ways of, of making that development as compact as possible, clearly a priority. Climate change and how that is going to affect the state in a number of different ways of priority. And that generational transfer. So thinking about what are those tools that is going to help keep land in agriculture as it moves from one generation to the next. And this is particularly important in the state, California, where you've got significantly more older farmers and older farmland owners than you do young farmers and ranchers coming into the business. So let's move on to policy. Our intention with the policy scorecard is to highlight effective elements of state policies that address what we have seen as the three main drivers of agricultural land conversion to date. So that poorly planned development, um, weak agricultural viability or profitability in agriculture over various time frames, and the fact that land is most vulnerable when it transfers between generations. While AFT has been at the forefront of federal and state policy development around farm and ranch land retention and protection since our founding, this is our first effort at a state policy scorecard. And on that note, we know that there are many ways that states support agriculture. This is not an attempt to score them all. Instead, we focused on the six different types of policies and programs that tie directly to the land. And we only used those where there was a critical mass of states so that 10 or more states had them. So for instance, while we consider California's farmland mapping program an innovation, it's not here. We actually wanted to include it in the scorecard, but it was the only state, so it didn't make sense to do it. Instead, it's now one of our recommendations to states that every state should do, as California has done in terms of a comprehensive mapping and analysis of its agricultural land base. So let's look at the policies we did include. Beth, if you can scroll up just a minute. Um, we looked at the purchase of agricultural conservation easement programs. So these are also known as farmland preservation programs or farmland conservation or purchase of development right programs, right? And California has a number of these programs and we'll get to that. We look at land use planning and growth management. And again, this is something that we recognize that there is a role for, this is largely in the purview of um, local government, not state government, but state government can play an important role and we wanted to look at that. We look at property tax relief for agricultural land. Again, we feel like this is important to the business support for agriculture of providing that preferential tax 
um, assessment for agricultural land, recognizing that working lands require fewer services um, than they typically need to are required to pay in property taxes. Um, we looked at agricultural district programs. So these are programs in 16 states, including California through the Williamson Act, that try to provide a bundle of um, ways of supporting agriculture through those districts. And then the last two that we looked at were farm link and state leasing programs. And just an important point to note on the farm link programs, we looked only at state sponsored farm link programs. We know that California has a very robust program run by California farm link, um, but we purposefully restricted our look again because these were considered state policies that we wanted to focus specifically on state sponsored ones because we believe that that indicates support um, for trying to help get a next generation of farmers and ranchers securely onto land. So now Beth if we can go down and see how California scored relative to other states. So on the pace front it's um, you know a little above median it's well above the median for planning and property taxes in agricultural districts and below the median for state leasing. And as I said, because it's not a state sponsored program, it gets no score for farmland. So the website allows you to dive into the factors behind the scores. So you go to the select the policy or program and see the drop down menu. And so we're going to start with, first with PACE programs. California was scored on the basis of three programs. The Farmland Conservancy Program started in 1995, the Agricultural Land Mitigation Program, and the Innovative Sustainable Agricultural Lands Conservation or SALC Program. SALC, established in 2015, has awarded 100 agricultural conservation easements funded in 36 counties covering over 112,000 acres of protected ag land for a total of 180 million, which is significant. Importantly, it includes funding for local land use planning to protect agricultural land, combining easement and planning grants for comprehensive farmland protection approaches. There are some other state funding sources that fund ag conservation easements in California that were not included, namely the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Wildlife Conservation Board programs, and they will be included in future policy scorecard updates. So looking at California's PACE score, the thing that stands out is the relatively low average funds spent per capita compared to the investments made by other states. We are looking here at cumulative investments made since 1995, but states that have been permanently protecting farmland over that same time period or longer have invested significantly more than has California. So for instance, Delaware, um, has provided six dollars, a little over six dollars per capita for farmland protection compared to 11 cents per capita in California. Another thing to note is that we gave points for PACE programs that include provisions to address farmland affordability, such as an option to purchase at ag value or an affirmative farming covenant. We know that this is a subject of real interest in California, um, that, and we also know that the OPAB tool may not be the perfect mechanism and that there are some um, entities that are putting in um, for affirmative covenants to farm. So we look forward to continuing to work with partners to find a way to address this challenge in California. <clears throat> I always want to stop and mention the Federal Agricultural Conservation Easement Program which provides an important source of matching funds for California's farm and ranch land protection efforts. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 2019, California received over $8 million through ASEP. Looking forward, we think that the 2018 Farm Bill and the $2 billion it offers through the ASEP program is a big opportunity for California. Um, and we just want to commend those in California who played an important role um, in making the case for this funding in the 2018 Farm Bill and to the delegation for supporting those efforts. So let's move to land use planning. 
Um, you'll see the California scores in the top 10 states. I do want to note one mistake we discovered after putting the scorecard together, and that's the, you'll see there's a zero there for farmland protection planning. That is wrong, um, our apologies. We realize that we should have given California points here because of the planning grants available through SALT. So we will fix that as well in the next iteration. We understand that land use planning is driven largely at the county and municipal level in California as elsewhere, and the suite of tools available to those county and local governments to support compact development and protect ag land must be robust and allow for innovation. And California's AFT office is certainly focused on that as well. Um, our intent with this piece of the scorecard is to look at how every state government is steering or supporting these decisions in a way that supports the agricultural land base. And here you see that California gets points for requiring comprehensive or general plans at the county level and providing some support towards implementation of those plans. Where it does not get points relative to some other states is around required consistency with state goals related to retaining farm and ranch land. So moving now to property tax relief. For California, this is the Williamson Act. California gets um, top billing here um, for the Williamson Act, even though we know that there are improvements that could be made to it. I note that there are over 16 million acres of ag land enrolled. One of the places where the Williamson Act did not get full points is on withdrawal penalties. While California does impose a cancellation fee, a number of other states use those withdrawal taxes or fees to plow back into their state farm and ranch land protection efforts. Um, on agricultural districts, California scores well again with the Williamson's Act Agricultural Preserves and Farmland Security Areas. One place where it did not score points relative to other states is the nexus between enrollment in these zones and permanent farmland protection. Some states use their districts as a way to prioritize participation in their PACE programs. And I should have noted, and I apologize, Beth, if you would scroll down to the bottom, the way that we score these is explained at the bottom of these sheets where you can see how we scored it, how um, what was included in the scores, what was not included in the points given. And again, there was a weighting factor that went into all of these. And if folks want more information about that, we are happy to provide what we call the back sheets that go along. Um, lastly, on state leasing, um, California does not get a very high score. The states that do have high scores in this category have done a comprehensive inventory of state-owned land that can be made available for, for farming or ranching, and then promote the use of that land through a transparent process. We feel that state leasing of leasing of state-owned land is an important mechanism for identifying new land access opportunities, especially smaller plot parcels in and near urban areas. So we're going to stop there. I hope that there are questions. If there are, please write them down now. As we go out of the website, we're going to launch a poll which asks which policy or policies you think would be most valuable to focus on for California. And again, I'm sorry that the last two, state leasing and farm link, um, did not make it into here because we had a limited amount of space. If you think that those are either of those are the highest, please write that in. Um, but this, again, is helpful to think collectively about where people see the greatest need for focus um, in terms of state policy. And I should have said you can vote for more than one. My apologies.
Okay. So again, this is, um, it's useful to see that um, land use planning, and I assume this is both how the state can do more um, to uh, encourage local government um, to be more effective at promoting compact development, retaining more agricultural land is at the top of the list, followed by um, purchase of ag conservation easements, and I assume that's in part about funding as well as um, potential tweaks to the program. Um, so we're going to go back out now, and before we go to questions, um, I just want to say one thing that was missing in our analysis was um, protected agricultural land. Um, there is not a comprehensive national data layer focused specifically on agricultural land protection. We are building this new database now, um, and you can see it's wonderful to see all the green in California. So we clearly have some information. I believe we have state-held state, um, state -held easements. If you have not heard from us and you do hold agricultural easements, please let us know by adding a comment in the question panel, and we will be in touch with you because we are trying to make this as robust and accurate a data layer as we can. And as with the rest of our data, we will make this available once we've built it out. So let's stop. And Katie, um, do you want to? Yeah. The Thanks, Chris. A couple of great questions that have been flowing in here. Um, I'm going to start off with a fantastic one about demographics. Uh, demographic change in California is huge, and 98% of farmland nationally is owned by white people. What can we do to ensure that efforts to protect farmland do not reinforce this existing in inequity? And farmers of color also, another comment here, are re uh, growing regarding or rapidly and have major challenges accessing land. Addressing the racial inequity in land ownership during transition will be key to keeping land in farming in California. Um, Kara, would you like to take on that question? Sure, Katie, thank you. Um, and thanks for the question. Um, I definitely think that that topic in itself uh, deserves at least its own webinar, but I, I will take a, a, a stab at some of the, the ways I think that we could be um, addressing this issue, which is one of, um, which has a long legacy in this country and in California. Um, one of the things that Chris just talked about was um, state leasing of agricultural land. And I think that that's something that we could do in California to provide a lot more opportunity to folks that aren't traditionally owning the land and um, creating more opportunity for more diverse populations to be landowners of agricultural land. Um, so that's one idea. Um, another um, policy recommendation that I'm gonna be talking about in a couple minutes is having a state funded farm link program. And that does occur in some other states in the country. And I think that would provide a lot more opportunity to folks that have not been reached or are histor historically underserved. Um, also, a couple more things. Um, AFT has a national ag um, land access training program. We work with uh, folks like California Farm Link and other people all throughout the state that provide a, a curriculum for land access trainers to help folks find um, land to begin farming. And then the last thing I would mention is it's really critical that we provide a programmatic opportunities in different languages. I don't see a lot of that in California and beyond, and I think we could do a much better job in uh, leveling the playing field and making programs more accessible to a diverse population by having different languages offered. So that's those are my ideas. I'm sure there's many more, but um, given our time, that's what I think so far. Great, thank you for answering that, Kara. Um, another one that might be right up in your alley here is um, a question regarding our study and whether or not AFT studied measured the role of water availability and regulatory burden on the inability to farm some land in California profitably, and thus the sale, um, uh, the sale and the conversion of that land uh, to other uses. Um, and I think that speaks uh, to a lot of California's work. Kara, do you want to tackle that? 
Yeah, I think what I'd like to do on this one, um, we anticipated that we would definitely get questions about um, water and the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act today. And if we didn't, I would have been surprised. Um, I think that Chris, if you wanna start just by saying um, what the national study did around uh, water availability, and then I can talk a little bit more about what we're doing in California, uh, specifically in the San Joaquin Valley. Great, um, thanks, I can do that, Kara. Um, the short, it's, it, it's not an, it wasn't easy to do, and the short answer is, is that we would like to have um, been able to look more comprehensively at water availability. We did not um, look at uh, aquifers, we did not look at groundwater at all, and where its water is incorporated at all is around that um, nationally significant agricultural land, but even there, it was difficult because what we were using for NRCS data around land um, capability classes, and uh, that doesn't necessarily distinguish between whether it, it, it allows for the better the land capability um, factors in water availability, but it doesn't look at the source of that water is my understanding. Now, again, I'm not the expert. I wasn't involved in the, in the spatial analysis here, but my understanding is that it's a very limited look um, and that nationally significant tends to say that yes, there's water available, but we don't know how long that water is available for. And so in terms of thinking about that, I know that our research team is, we are going to do a phase three of this project that is going to be doing some predictive analyses. And I believe that one of the layers that we will be looking at is water. Excellent. So Oh, but then Kara was, I think, had a... Yeah, I yes. was just kind of speak to what we've been doing in, in California around this. I, I actually call it Farms Under Threat 2.0, but that has not been um, officially approved by American Farmland Trust. But uh, a few years ago, uh, we partnered with the Conservation Biology Institute, who is the creator of Data Basin to conduct a spatial analysis to determine where agricultural land and water resources are most at risk. And that can be from climate challenges, regulatory challenges and the like. And so understanding, how, and we did this focused on the San Joaquin Valley, and we really are promoting this same kind of analysis. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit later, but we, we'd like to promote that same kind of analysis happen statewide. Um, so we're really protecting our most productive, versatile, and resilient farmland, but also that has the most um, future uh, water reliability. And so we have done that in the San Joaquin Valley. And so understanding how and where water supply shortages, soil impairment, urban growth, or climatic changes may impact agriculture guided our San Joaquin project. And we are, are using that spatial analysis for the selection of our ag easement demonstration sites that have this high PVR value and high groundwater recharge potential. Wonderful. And um, we will take one more question here. And to what extent do the inordinary, inordinately high real estate values in California pose a danger to agricultural use of land? Sarah, do you want to pick that or you want me to pick stab at it? Why don't you start? <laughs> well, I think I think there are a number of different ways um, that it is. I mean, I think about it in a couple of different ways. It um, it's one a barrier, obviously, to getting on the land and back to what we were just talking about in terms of um, historically underserved populations and interest in trying to get onto land. How do you do that with, with values that are this high? Um, you know, obviously these high values also um, require a very intensive production and that is a challenge in its own right in a number of different ways. But the lastly, the one that I think about because I know that we've had conversations about it in California is the high values on, of 
protected land even, and the sale of land that's protected that may not be going to a farmer or rancher, but somebody who just wants a preserved property. And that affects how easements are valued in the first place. And I know that there have been efforts and thinking in California that's going around thinking about how, is there an alternative way of valuing agricultural conservation easements um, because we want it to be a mechanism that works and because of those high after values as we call them, it is often a challenge for folks who are trying to protect farmland and ranch land. So that, that's some of the challenges and, and those are ones that I'm going to talk a little bit about here at the end about the National Agricultural Land Network. Um, I would love for us to be having further conversations in California on that topic. Kara, anything to add to that? No, I think that, that you hit the nail on the head. I think that um, at the same time, I had been muted, sorry about that. Um, at the same time, although there's a, always been a lot of pressure, um, development pressure in California, that hasn't really changed um, in, in several decades. There's also an, a, a growing awareness, and especially with the pandemic, around the value of local food and and food systems, and and how important that's becoming to people. You know, when I first started at AFT, um, we we said all the time, we're losing 50,000 acres of farmland every year, and um, that sounds like a lot, but it really wasn't resonating very much with folks because I, as I always say, you can uh, drive for hours still and see farmland as as far as the eye can see. But I think when when the um, some recent events have really uh, brought it into focus that um, without that local farmland, we don't have that local food supply. So a little unrelated to the to the question, but I think increased awareness also by the general public um, helps with the the issue of uh, developing in the right places. Okay, so I think, thank you, Katie. I think we're gonna stop there um, and move on a little bit because we wanna give Kara a chance to talk about California. But um, Beth, if we can go to the, to the next slide. Um, this is American Farmland Trust recognizes that time is not on our side in saving our farm and ranch land, which is why as part of this project, we announced a, a bold goal of doubling the amount of permanently protected farmland and ranch land across the country by 2040 and reducing the rate of, farm, of um, farmland conversion from 2,000 acres a day down to 500 acres a day by 2040. How are we going to get there? Uh, AFT is strengthening its own commitment to farm and ranch land protection, but this is an effort that is going to require a multitude of partners, um, as it always has, and California has been at the forefront of that, obviously, for a long time. What are we doing? We're establishing the National Agricultural Land Network. I'll talk about that later. Providing new leadership in key locations, AFT is um, focusing more in efforts, particularly where you saw that national map across the south is where some of the biggest conversion is and we are focusing on that region especially um, as far as new efforts protecting more farmland ourselves we've always been an agricultural land trust we are continuing to do that to work with partners where we are needed and where we can add value um, we will continue our role and step up our role for stronger state and federal policies around not just protection, but retaining agricultural land. And again, the promoting research-based decision-making, we will continue to do research. I mentioned that we are doing a um, next iteration of um, uh, Farms Under Threat, um, which will hopefully provide even more tools to our partners. So Kara, now to you about California. Thanks, Chris. I just wanted to thank you again for joining us today. You're such a huge asset to us at 
at AFT in California and nationally. So, you know, a lot of the folks on the line from who I saw registered are probably pretty familiar with some of the things I'm going to go over today, but there are so many things that we can be doing to protecting our most valuable farmland. And it's much more than I'm going to go over in the next two slides. But we did want to share what we're prioritizing as far as our policy approaches um, moving forward, not only in response to the farms under threat research for California, but just in general. And some of these are long-term efforts of AFTs. So the first two that I'm going to go over, um, AFT has been pivotal in creating both of these programs. We co-sponsored bills in both cases to create them. And our top priority as a response to farms under threat is to maintain funding for the Sustainable Ag Lands Conservation Program. Many of you on the line are probably, you know, have received funding from this program. And many of you know that it has really been a game changer in farmland protection in California. And you can just tell by the statistics that that's the case. So since 2015, SALC has funded 100 ag conservation easements covering over 120, 12,000 acres of permanently protected ag land. And as Chris also mentioned, SALC has this very unique funding source that funds um, local planning for agriculture at the local level. And that is quite, quite unusual um, to have that kind of funding. And it is so important that we maintain it. And SALC is funded by cap and trade funds through the, through the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund Program. And just to give you an idea of what we're up against is that the cap and trade auction funds recently um, had a $25 million take in, and that's typically 600 to 800 million. And so we're gonna to need to look at a lot of creative ways with several of you on the line in keeping SALC um, in play um, for the long term. The other program is maintaining funding for the Cal California Farmland Conservancy Program. I would say it's the lesser known program, but also very valuable. It's an often overlooked tool by lawmakers. Um, established in 1995 by a bill sponsored by AFT. It is um, funded 184 ag conservation easements since that time. And so although it's a much smaller funding source, uh, you know, we have been recipients as, as, of this funding source as have many other folks. And so it's a critical goal of ours to keep that in play. The third thing I'd like to highlight is increasing access and funding for land access and farm viability programs. And Chris is gonna talk more later about the resources that AFT is gonna provide for, through our National Agricultural Land Network. And we're gonna plug this a few times because we'd love for you to sign up for it and uh, be part of uh, future information and dialogue around these issues. But we also really have a focus on supporting state funding for land linking programs. And again, we have a great land link program called California Farm Link in California, but it is primarily you know, it's a private nonprofit, and that is very different than having a state funded farm link program. And so we really support the state putting investment into that. Next slide, please. A lot of folks had questions this morning more than we were able to answer about the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And obviously that's very top of mind for everyone in California and how farmers are going to comply with that. And we're very focused in the San Joaquin Valley as we have been for a few uh, decades. And so we're very keyed into what farmers need there, but also in other areas of the state where uh, the staff has been um, involved in Sigma, like myself in Sonoma County. So one of the things that we're very focused on, even with our own bill, AB 3263, is technical assistance programs that help farmers comply with Sigma. And so that's boots on the ground to help farmers do water conservation planning on their farm so they can stay in farming and that we're not losing our most productive land due to that regulation. A couple more items here. This uh, second to last one is, is a large one, but obviously very important in California and beyond. And that is to plan for agriculture, not just to, for land use. And AFT has long been focused on this to promote the development of state and local policies that provide incentives for local governments to adjust their general plans and spheres of influence to be consistent with high density infill and related smart growth strategies that reduce and mitigate the urbanization of adjacent productive farmland. And at the same time, um, protecting groundwater recharge sites. And this is a very complicated issue, but as you can see, we could do more. There are other states that have more uh, connection to state policies that connect with local level policies around this topic. 
And lastly, I'd just like to also say that a, a um, high priority of ours is to promote the use of data analysis that identifies the most productive, versatile, and reliable farmland with future water supply reliability. And I mentioned earlier uh, Databasin, which is a, a tool created by Conservation Biology Institute and how we partnered with them in the San Joaquin Valley. And it's a great open source tool available to anyone who wants to look at different layers in their area and look at water supply reliability at the regional and parcel scale in the San Joaquin Valley in particular. And, and the value and the productiveness of the farmland at the same time. So we really feel that it's key to look at the intersection of land and water when you're looking at preserving farmland. So we're putting our, um, our dollars into the most impactful conservation projects. And with that, I'm gonna go head back to Chris. Great, and I think Katie that we have time if there are questions that we have time for a couple before um, we wrap up. Great, thank you for that, Chris. Um, I did wanna mention that Iris with um, California Farm Link had provided her information. So if there are any folks that would like to connect um, with the work that they're doing, she um, mentioned specifically that they are working with Latino uh, farmers and partners to help collaborate on some of these conservation easements. Um, we, are, we are happy to connect folks um, along those lines. Um, another question that comes to us is um, looking at um, whether or not the PVR or the prime versatile resilient um, classification that AFT is using, does it take into account water availability? I was wondering if maybe one of you could speak to that. Right, so that is where um, I was trying to explain on the earlier question that where the PVR values, um, where it's incorporated is in those soil and land characteristics that go into some of the NRCS um, data for land capability classes of farmland. And my understanding is that those higher classifications look at the availability of water, but they don't look at the sort of long-term availability of that water. Um, so that it it takes into account the higher the PVR value, again, and this is a lay person speaking, and we can get more information to folks who want more about exactly how this was included. You might actually find some of this on, the, on that PVR um, methodology tab that we talked about or at the beginning of the webinar. But um, we did, we did incorporate it through those NRCS um, land capability classifications, but it does not really address the question of for what the source of that water is and how long it may or may not be available. And I think part of this is because, again, this was a national study um, and that information that Kara was talking to about the data, about the whatever the basin is, um, is, that is a California product, it's not available nationally. So we had a challenge again that this is a national study, it's only as good as the um, information that's available nationally. So I know that water will be a um, at least a partial focus of future analyses that we do on this one. Fantastic. Um, there's an easy one right here. I'll give you a softball for the last closing question. And that is um, in regards to um, whether or not attendees will get a copy of today's PowerPoint. <laughs> Absolutely, they will. We will um, be sending out a link. And in fact, when we send out the link, you will, you will get a, um, a smorgasbord of resources. You will get a link to the full report to the state highlight summaries to the whole entire webinar. And again, if you look at this slide, you see that the website link, but we'll send that out as well, that it's um, farmland.org backslash farms under threat, all one string. And that takes you to that interactive website. So I hope you'll be happy with the multitude of resources that we will send to you. Hopefully we won't inundate you. 
Um, so let me, let me close then my um, last part of this by talking about two resources. Um, and that's the Farmland Information Center and the National Agricultural Land Network. Let me start with the Farmland Information Center, or FIC, as it's affectionately known here at AFT. Um, this is a collaboration we've had with USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service for decades. Um, it is a web-based presence, and it's a technical answering service. If you are a landowner or no landowners that you just want to direct them to this site, so we get calls from farmers and ranchers who say, I want to learn about how to protect my farm or ranch. Typically what we do, we give them, we send them to the resources available on the FIC and we send them to the find a program and a land trust in your area. So we do have a directory of land trusts that focus on agricultural land that's included in there. Um, there's, it's also a wealth of information with statistics, with state policy examples. There's really not much in the arena of farm and ranch land protection that is not on that website, include, including things that make the case. So resources that are both from AFT and from many other research partners, academic partners, um, that can be found on that um, uh, website. So I really suggest that people look at it just in terms of knowing what is available. Um, and now turning to the National Agricultural Land Network. This is something that is newly launched by AFT this year. Um, we, we, with it, what we want to do is to build the collective capacity of folks who are engaged in agricultural land protection and retention um, so that we can all learn from each other and do more. So it is for folks who are working in state government, for county planning agencies, for land trusts, for soil and water conservation districts. The focus is on agriculture land protection and how it connects to many other things. So as Carol was talking about, how it connects to land access. How do we, how do we combine ways that are thinking about um, protecting farmland and making greater opportunities for many farmers and ranchers, particularly folks who are first generation? Um, how do we make those connections stronger between agricultural land protection and climate change. And in that case, again, California has been a leader. But we see this as a way of, of peer networking, of information sharing, and some basic educational tools. Um, we are going to be doing a series of policy webinars starting in the early fall that, again, are going to dig into the policy scorecard and it's specific like what, what does it take to have good land use planning? What does that mean at the state level? And then later, um, a suite of webinars focused on sort of local um, and county-based land use um, planning and zoning tools. But that is um, on the books for the fall. We are also looking to see where we can be helpful in a state like California of um, bringing folks together to have those elevated conversations as we did last summer for those of you who were um, who joined us where can we be adding value to those conversations and encouraging some thinking around affordability tools um, and other land access challenges so we are really excited that we have KLEE Bright from the Department of Conservation and Jameson Watts from Marin Agland Trust, who have agreed to serve on our steering committee, so California is well represented. We also will have Ed Thompson, who while he has, um, I think, officially, I mean, he's officially retired from AFT, but we have managed to rope him back into being um, part of the steering committee as well. So with that, um, I hope that folks will sign up for the network. Please give me a call if you have any questions about it. And with that, Kara, let me turn it back to you for any closing thoughts. Yeah, just a couple of things. I wanted to mention uh, one on the technical side of what we're talking about today, and then one on the engagement side. 
Um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate that this is just the beginning of the conversation. Uh, these are very, um, very robust topics. And so the National Ag Land Network really provides a, a good opportunity to dig into these. An example of that is, you know, we're talking about this database and tool and, you know, the interplay as uh, we got a comment that the interplay of PVR and water availability are critical in determining whether or not it is a locally appropriate tool. And so I just wanted to echo that since that's such a critical concern in California and that we will continue to have that conversation with many of you. Um, and I think my last statement is just to thank you all for, for joining and to please stay engaged. Um, AFT is known by some, but not by many. And we um, as an organization have so much to offer, but we also have so much to learn and just hope that you'll continue to engage with us on these really important issues. And with that, I think we're all done, right, Chris? We are, so thank you all. And thank you, Katie, Kara, and Beth for um, your involvement here. Thanks, everyone.